Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe here from East Makostan. Hello and greetings. And we are continuing with the ruined, the ruin of Balerian. Now, excuse me. The chapter continues, and I have my hardcover edition from page 146. And the thing is, in the aftermath of the battle of, well, fl of flames, of sudden flame, we have Morgoth's power that overshadows the whole of the Northlands. Uh, Barahir, a human who worked with, well, to help Finrod Felagund, um, does not return to the, go to the Thronian, but rather flees elsewhere. Now, his clan is targeted, and a good number of them die, until Barahir only has 12 men. And they are Baron, his son, Baragund, Belagund, his nephews, the sons of Bregolos, and nine faithful servants of his house. And they are Rathruin, no, Rathru, Rathruin, Dairuin, Dagnir, Ragnor, Gildor, Gorlam, the unhappy, Arthad, Urthel, and Hathad, Hathaldir, the young. These men would become outlaws and they would try to um, well, they try to survive, basically. But the thing is, they're hunted like animals. And most of them are butchered like them. Now, for nearly two years, the Noldor defend the Western Pass near Syrian, and there they run into, well, they hold off pretty well. And two years is a great job because by then, you know, the Noldor have had time to start to rally in that region or at least further south. Um, of course, because it's Orodreth, fans hold them to shame for this because the fortress did eventually fall, the fortress of tall Syrian and the thing is he was attacked by Gorthor or Sauron who was a Maiar and Sauron would take over tall Syrian chasing Orodreth out and it became called tall Ingorhoth the Isle of Werewolves like I said though Orodreth is Vast, is massively hated by a lot of fans um, or at least scorned but he held the pass for two years for shame that it even fell in the first place but I'd like to see a lot of people do better I mean Sauron came to his doorstep yeah this and, isn't just uh... but here's the thing he held him off so that's a success. And that's something that, let us be frank, neither, so neither Elrond nor Galadriel accomplished. Yes, we've got Gil-galad who actually helped slay Sauron alongside Elendil. And I will actually freely say they are far more impressive than Orodreth. But let's not, let's not sell the guy short. He did a great job. But he could not hold the fortress Forever, he held on the enemy as long as he could. Then he withdrew. This was the correct decision to make. He did his job. But that's not why he's disliked. He's disliked because he later does lead Nagarfran to disaster on bad counsel from Turin to Rambar, which, no, I will not defend. That is, was not a good decision. On the other hand, in the event that he is the father of Gilgalad, he's but he made sure to send his son to the Grey Havens, so that you know. But anyways, I almost said that in French. I gotta be careful. Um, this is an English channel. That said, Morgoth would try to lure to his service 
the men of the three houses of the Adain wouldn't go over well. So he would start hunting them down. And he sent messengers over the mountains. And that's when um, he prepares a new trap for the elves. And this is when he tricks and prepares a grand strategy. So the men already in Balerion refuse to take his deal. They don't trust him. So he sends for men who will work for him and are his slaves, the Easterlings. And the first thing the Easterlings do is ally with Maethros. The trouble is Maethros thinks, well, I've allied with men. Aren't men on my side? Oh, there's new men here that are even more of a warrior society. They must be on my, you know, I can trust them. Uh-oh. And so Maethros, when he, the first hint is these guys are capitalists. I'm joking. That they say, well, work for anyone for money. Okay, here's all the gold you want. Work for me. Little does he realize that men who can be bought and trafficked with gold are never loyal. Because men who can be bought that easily, like that, have no loyalties. And the thing is, so long as some things are not for sale, such as honor and duty and love, you can trust those men because there's things they will never sell. But men who say everything is for sale, well, you know, their honor is for sale. And that's the general idea here. So what you have is, in effect, the Easterlings, who are sellswords. And the trouble is, Maethros is accustomed to dealing with very honorable men and women. And he's confronted by sellswords. So he decides, well, they're men, so I have to trust them. Don't. But he does. And... Um, no, I'm not taking pot shots at like things like capitalism. I was just cracking a joke, but like the thing here is, you know, th these aren't men you should trust, but he does so very naively. And amongst the greatest of these chieftains, there's Bor and Olfang. Um, Bor, the sons of Bor are Borlad, Borlak, and Borthand. Um, and they followed Maethros and Maglor, and cheated the hopes of Morgoth. These men remained faithful to Maethros. It's the sons of Olfang the Black, who are Olfast, Olwarf, and Oldor the Accursed. And they would follow Caranthir and break their allegiance to Caranthir. So, the Feanorians, in effect, bring under their wings many of the Easterlings. Some remain faithful, most do not. And this is going to be the undoing of Maethros. So, yeah, that's not good. As to, of course, the... Oh, and there's also one misunderstanding that, now that I think about it, uh, some have misunderstood, and that's that because the Easterlings were supposed to be, uh, quite frankly, from the East, and they're basically, insert evil humans here, um, you know, this must be, and I have heard about this, mostly from Miyazaki, who really doesn't understand Tolkien, uh, the idea is that the these people have misunderstood that, oh, this means Tolkien hated Asians. This is like, oh, um, let me see. I don't like rotten cheese. Ergo, I hate all the French. The, the, it's that sort of one plus five equals eight. No, one plus five equals six. But we're going to get at eight or 20 because we're just going to jump numbers. And this is where, I'm going to say this, Miyazaki is a brilliant artist, but at times, when it comes to things like this, he's a bit of an idiot. I'm just going to be blunt. And the thing is, um, he's also an edgelord, Miyazaki. I've noticed that in his interviews. He loves to do, say, edgy things to get into the media 
that brings him media attention and then he can sell his current movie which the problem with that is that i've seen it on youtube and it's just an utterly bonkers um take because the trouble is if you stand against something if you stand against everything you stand for nothing and i really love miyazaki's work but tolkien was not being bigoted for a, for as much as old thing and his sons uh, betrayed he does mention that bor the borsons are loyal exactly so which, we, which shows they have we have both yeah but he also mentions that these are simply two of the greatest chieftains there are many more now we also have to bear in mind how does tolkien portray the descendants of elros a lot of them are not portrayed very nicely a lot of the mightiest of the men of western essie that is to say western men are scum the thing is you know this is this is not what tolkien was saying tolkien did not really distinguish actually here's the interesting thing tolkien looked at things more in terms of culture and faith like whether you're catholic or not he was a very nuanced thinker in man and the thing is well for one thing he's well beloved in uh asia we have several asian fans on our channel and they the a lot of them um their knowledge of of the legendarium probably surpasses my own by a huge margin and the thing is, we have to bear in mind, Tolkien is not making a barbed attack at anyone. The Easterlings are, well, fictional, for one thing. And for another thing, we don't know which Easterners they are. They could be Eastern European, they could be the Eastern this, Eastern that. Um, on the other hand, Westerners aren't always well betrayed in his work, as uh, we can also be villains. And we see heroes on both sides. Um, we have to bear in mind, though, the um, for some reason, like I said, some people, like, I think the one who popularized this accusation was Miyazaki. But he just did it because he, you know, he's got to sell a movie. So it's great to basically say... Um, point the finger at Tolkien so that he can sell something. The thing is, Miyazaki, for example, sought to, like he very publicly fought with his sons to sell the Earthsea movie. This is a guy who's an edgelord. He will say and pick fights to sell something. Notice that he, it's always when he has a movie that comes out. Now, I really like a lot of his animation but he says and does things to sell. This is a marketing tactic because any publicity is good publicity. And I know some people will say, you're attacking Miyazaki. But I do like a lot of his work. I think a lot of his work is beautiful. But let's be honest about the fact that he's a very crafty marketing expert. Um... If you want someone who's a lot more sincere in his marketing, uh, I would say Toriyama is a great mangaka who, an animator who never did that sort of thing. So, actually, I, now that I think about it, I, I really do miss Toriyama. He was such an earnest animator and uh, comic book artist and whatnot. Like I said, I, anyways, tangent aside, um, actually, this is also why I kind of like Don Bloop, because there was never any of this edgelord stuff. And if you, if you think, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, I follow and watch every interview and documentary I can on Miyazaki and Tolkien. So, and Miyazaki, like I said, there's always a scandal whenever there's a movie that comes out. Why is there always a scandal or some comment that gets them up in the media? He's got to sell his movie. 
So, and I've seen this tactic used for years on YouTube and many other places. Um, and I will argue to an extent, it's why Don Bluth eventually faded and because Don wasn't marketing. Don just wanted to animate. He didn't want to make edgelord comments against this person or that person. Miyazaki knows how to market. So in that regard, he's very, very clever. Now, the Easterlings are, I would argue they're more comparable to the Picts to an extent in Howard's Legendarium and Hiborian Age and Thurian Age. Um, but anyways, um, now we get later in this chapter, the tale of Hurin. Hurin and his brother Huor are fostered in Brethel, but then they run into trouble with some orcs, are rescued by Thorondor, the king of the eagles, and they stay a time with uh, Turgon, who teaches them elvish wisdom. And the thing is, they eventually get homesick and want to go home. Turgon is reluctant to let them go, but after a heart-to-heart -heart chat, decides, okay, you can go home. And Maeglin the king's nephew, makes them swear an oath because he doesn't trust them. And that's rich, considering, you know, Meglin's history. Um, but the trouble is, Turgon does not reprimand his nephew. So, um, yeah... He tacitly allows this. So, the trouble is, Turgon's a good host, his nephew is not. But his nephew is misbehaving and acting like he's crown prince, when he's not. But Turgon, if he was a good ruler, would slap his nephew down and say, don't talk to my guest and foster sons that way. You are not king, and you are not crown prince. But the thing is... Like, we got to compare it to, say, Mufasa and Scar. When Scar backtalks Mufasa and misbehaves, what does Mufasa do at the beginning of Lion King? He tells Scar off and tells him, you will not be behaving that way. I am king. You will behave yourself and comport yourself, Scar. Here, Turgon doesn't do that. And we get, a, we get Tolkien showing us very openly that Turgon is a very weak ruler. And we also find out very... Interestingly, in this chapter of the Silmarillion, that Morgoth fears two individuals. And this makes him, um, let me see, how do I word it? He has won great victories, but he doesn't revel in them. He's actually disquieted and frightened because Finrod, Felagund, and Turgon have disappeared. He doesn't know where they are. This frightens him. What does this show? Morgoth's a coward. Why, why should he frighten, be frightened of two minor elves like this? Now, Vinrod is kind of one thing. But let us be honest. Turgon's not very smart. He's incompetent. He let himself be walked all over. He's Zap Brannigan. But the trouble is... Um... He's Zap Brannigan, but Morgoth fears him. That should show there is something more here about Turgon. Or rather, something connected to Turgon that frightens Morgoth. Morgoth has a sense of it, but not a knowledge of it. He can feel it, but doesn't know it. With Finrod Felagund, um, he's, he knows Finrod to be one of the greatest of the Noldor. So naturally he fears him. Well, Finrod is someone who will have a massive amount of influence. He already is. In some ways, he's one of the main characters of this arc. And, yeah, there's a lot more that can be said. But we have to make an announcement. We'll be stepping out of the Silmarillion to an extent. 
and into the Baron and Luthien book. And so the Silmarillion podcast will be following the Baron and Luthien novel until we conclude that. And then we come back to this chapter of Baron and Luthien and then we continue with the tale because this book is really, 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 really good. And it is... Enough for leave? No. I could have gone on for another few minutes. Um, this chap, this part of the chapter is just clearing up leftover and set up for the next story. Um, this is the closeout of the Fingolfin story. So if we consider it kind of the lay of Fingolfin, I believe you said that your favorite story was the tale of Feanor. I would say that is probably the best part we've read so far. But I'll say that the best written um, scene in some ways was the death of Fingolfin. Yes, I can't argue with that. Now, some people I've seen online called Fingolfin a fool for challenging Morgoth. And I view, or that he wasn't a good king because he, when he fought everything lost, he decided to challenge him. But I think it was more, I'm going to go down fighting. But we got to bear in mind, he scared Morgoth and scarred and crippled Morgoth. Morgoth is lame now. He'll never properly walk again. He and, cannot leave his fortress. And Fingolfin did one other thing. He showed that Morgoth is not invincible. No. And this is the first chink in the armor. And, but, as a villain, Morgoth is one of the greatest in literature because these losses, these physical ailments, he uses to lure his enemies into a trap. And that'll be it for today. So don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button. And don't forget to tell us in the comment section your thoughts on this part of the Silmarillion. Because next time we discuss the Silmarillion, we will be dealing with Baron and Luthien. So until then, don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button to stay tuned for the next video. And also check out our book, Crown of Blood, which you can get and find in the description down below. And you can also, if you want, check out our Substack, where we write all manner of dorkly and nerdy essays and we are now starting a book commentary on the hobbit which is already proving fairly popular so you can check that in the description down below also so until then take care